morning and welcome to Holy Trinity for this our worship on the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. If you're a guest or you're new or the first time watching and participating in our worship, then welcome. We're glad that you're with us. If you would go on our website, on the upper right hand corner there's a tab that says visiting. You can click on that and fill out an online visitor card or you can shoot me an email, Jeff, G-E-O-F-F, at holytrinitychurch.info and I'd love to connect you with what the Spirit is doing in the life of our parish. A couple announcements before we go further in our worship this morning. Uh, the first is it's a really exciting Sunday. They're all exciting, but this one is exciting because we are going to baptize a child into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, this for me, has been uh, an experience like none other over the last three or four months. And part of that has been, for a period of time, we ceased offering both sacraments, the, the dominical sacraments of, of communion and of baptism. And communion, baptism, and the Word are the lifeblood of the church. Thankfully, we were never apart from the Word, but we were apart from communion and we were apart from baptism for longer than any of us have ever been apart from those nourishing sacraments. And we've reinstituted, reinstituted communion um, for a small group outside who is comfortable coming to here to worship. And today we reinstitute baptism. And even if you're not able to be present or you don't feel comfortable being present for those communion services, uh, the sacraments don't work only individually. They work on a whole community of faith. In fact, that's, that's actually the primary way that the sacraments do nourish us. So even if you are not physically present for the baptism that we're going to do today or the communion services, you are being nourished by word and sacrament as a part of this body of believers. And I'm particularly thankful for the resumption uh, of baptism this morning. We're having a lot of uh, excitement and buy-in around our conversation project, which we're focusing on the gospel, race, and politics. The idea is let's get better at talking um, with each other about these difficult things as a way of getting in our reps, as a way of preparing ourselves for service out in the larger world. If you want to be a part of the next conversation, which is on July 12th, uh, shoot Shelly an email, plc at holytrinitychurch.info, and she can include you in the communications about those, um, I think, very fruitful conversations. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. In the Acts of the Apostles, the Lord said to us, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And let be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The appointed portion of the Psalter this morning is Psalm 89, verses 1 through 4 and 15 through 18. Please join me in saying the psalm in unison. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age, my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festival shall. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily in your name. They are jubilant in your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength, and by your favor our might is exalted. Truly the Lord is our ruler. The Holy One of Israel is our King.
reading from a letter of Paul to the Romans. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once yielded your members to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now yield your members to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But then what return did you get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the return you get is sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So between this past Sunday and this Sunday all the way through September, the lectionary has us reading through the second half of Romans. And I think it'd be really great for you to follow along with us as we preach our way through that second half of Romans. Uh, between this week and next, if you go ahead and read chapters 1 through 6, then you'll be caught up for next week. And next week's sermon is going to be on Romans 7, 15 through 25. Quick intro. Romans is the first letter of Paul in the order of the New Testament. It's his longest letter. And it's his most influential letter. It's Paul at the height of his powers. And it's unique in the New Testament in that Paul is writing to a church that he didn't plant, that he doesn't really know. And he's introducing himself to this church and explaining his understanding of the gospel. And, you know, ever the church planting spiritual entrepreneur... Paul wants to use Rome as a base of missionary support for a missionary journey that he plans to take to Spain, a journey that he never got to take, because um, as we know, he ended his life a martyr in Rome. Now, I want to be honest with you. Uh, Romans is a challenge. It's a demanding read, but it's a really good challenge, and y'all are really smart people, so if you take your time, and you slowly work your way through this thing, if you use the sermons that we're going to offer as a guide, I know that you're going to be blessed by any time that you spend with this letter. So let's get into it for this morning. Verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, how can that be? Aren't we always going to make mistakes? Yes, we are. But Paul is working with a larger, more expansive understanding of what sin means. Sin in this passage means to be under the power of a malevolent force. Sin understood in this way is not merely mistakes that individuals make, but it is being within a sphere of 
malevolent influence. So building on that understanding, if we think about sin as a sphere of influence, as a power that distorts and corrupts our lives, Paul also thinks that we as in humanity can't by our own efforts move from the sphere of sin into the life in Christ. So think of the sphere of sin as a circle and life in Christ as another circle, and it's, a, it's, like, it's the opposite of a Venn diagram. There's no overlap in these two circles. And that's where the breathtakingly good news of the gospel comes in, which is that Jesus' death has moved us from the circle or sphere of sin into life in Christ. It's made the move that we could never make on our behalf. We've been moved from the family or the circle of sin to the family of Christ. We've been taken from slavery to sin to citizenship in heaven. So, thinking about sin as a sphere of influence and moving from sin into Christ is a move we could never make, but a move that was made on our behalf through Christ's death, the passage starts to make a little bit more sense. But then, I hope you're asking, after you do a close reading of this passage, so if it's something that God has done on our behalf, but not what we can do, then why all the exhortation in verses 12 through 14? As you look at it, 12 through 14, it's got a lot of exhortation. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Do not yield your members to sin, but do yield yourselves to God. So, Paul has just stated previous to this that Christ moves us from this domain of sin to life in Christ. We can't do that ourselves, but it seems what he's saying is that we can move backwards. We can go backwards into the domain of sin. Now, why would we do that? If we can live in Christ, why do we want to be slaves to sin? Maybe we do that because it's familiar. Sin is not good, but it is familiar. Sin understood in this way is kind of a velvet ditch. Emily and I celebrated our 10th anniversary this past week, and we were thinking about our premarital counseling that we did with Bob Pritchard, who was a, a just much loved and legendary professor at Virginia Seminary. And he told us and led us to a lot of really uh, just pearls of wisdom as far as marriage is concerned. Uh, but one of the things that we've held on to pretty closely is that Dr. Pritchard said, you need to spend a lot of time prayerfully thinking about how your family of origin dealt with conflict. Because like it or not, you're going to find yourself repeating unconsciously those patterns of conflict within your marriage, but you don't have to. You can create new patterns, and with God's help, you can, you can create patterns of conflict where both parties can be heard, where both parties can listen and be also be assertive. I think that that wisdom about the unconscious pull of familiar sin, but also the, the good news of the potential to create new and life-giving patterns, I think that that wisdom is steeped in Paul's teaching. I think that's steeped in the wisdom that comes from God through St. Paul, which is that we don't have to be slaves to the past. We're no longer under the influence of sin. We can live as new creations within the life of Christ. So what I want you to take away from this morning is that sin is a power. A sphere of influence that may look like unconsciousness. Just going through life unconscious. Going along with destructive forces. I think if you understand sin that way, the scriptures start to make a lot of sense. Human failure starts to make a lot of sense. You know, it, it, it boggles the mind except that it does make sense about how sin works. That after hearing so much of the, of, of the emancipatory words of the New Testament, where Paul says there is neither slave nor Greek nor male or female, no barbarian, not Scythian. When Paul says those things, it took us 19 centuries 
to realize that the gospel was counter to the institution of slavery. That boggles the mind unless you understand that sin is an unconscious carrying forward of destructive patterns. And our call is to wake up to those destructive patterns and live as people awake to what God is doing in their lives. I, I think you can see in Paul the Christian roots of what we're now calling wokeness. And what I mean by that is not the, what I think is a destructive way of talking about woke or not woke, which is just a recapitulation of categories of under the law, not under the law, Jew and Greek um, that Paul teaches against, but is rather, I think, a characteristic of a people who are trying to be awake to what God is doing in their lives. It's actually a a consistent theme in Jesus' parables. You think of the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. You think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he bid the disciples to stay awake and pray with him on the night before his death. When Paul writes to the Romans about being dead to sin and alive in Christ, I think He is bidding the people of Rome and bidding us to be a people who are open to the movement of God above all things. People who with prayer are willing to follow that movement of God when it runs with the current of culture or against the current of culture. People who are willing to reevaluate and put away old destructive practices or reach back into the past and revive old ones. People who are awake to the destructive patterns that can develop in human relationships, that can develop in churches, that can develop in nations, and people who have grabbed hold of the good news of Jesus Christ, which is that we are today a new creation. We can create new patterns, new ways of being with God's help. Perhaps in in this time of virus and recession and social upheaval, this can also be a time of renewal, where with the power of the gospel, we can learn to be a people who are earnest and hungry to yield ourselves to God and actively watch and seek his ways to learn to be a people dead to sin and alive in God through Christ. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit. Open our eyes and our minds to the truth that we have been freed from sin and we now live through Christ. Lord, awaken us from sleep. Open our eyes to what you are doing in our midst. Free us from totalitizing ideologies. And make us open to the movement of your spirit. Make us open to where you would lead us, Lord. Make us open to the work you have placed in front of us and to the people that you are making us. Amen. Join me in saying the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate in the Virgin Mary and was made in Amen. For our sake, he was crucified in the conscious fire. He suffered death in the area. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Then his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, 
We acknowledge from the baptism of the forgiveness of sins. We look at the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people this morning are according to Form 3. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve. We pray for Glenda, our Bishop Coadjutor, Key, our Bishop, Michael, our Presiding Bishop, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Claire, Jeff, Bob, and Gail, our priests, for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for Donald, our president, Kay, our governor, Ron and Gary, our mayors, and all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. We pray for all those who serve in our armed forces. We pray for St. Dunstan's, as they call a rector. For St. Paul's Greensboro, St. Paul's Lounsboro, St. Paul's Mentor, St. Paul's Son. And for Patrick and Sarah, Sarah and Jogi, and the people of Namungo Village in Uganda. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion, O Lord, on John and Teresa McCarran, Nancy Thompson, Inez Barnett, Robin Feathers, Marty Frederick, Masha Kloberg, Willie Slay, Marilyn Miller, Key Lee, Kwong Wook Lim, Lori Bada Connor, Elizabeth Lundy, Jane Moran, Marcel Wood, Kiwan Han, Kim Rodney, and Barbara Johnson, and all those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest, especially Contavious Holland and Anne Skelton, stepmother of Trisha Skelton. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Lord, we pray for deliverance from this virus, for our leaders, for the scientists who study cure, for healthcare workers. Lord, we pray for all those out of work, all those affected by the recession. Lord, we ask for healing for our nation. Lord, what we have asked faithfully, grant that we may obtain effectually to the honor and glory of your name. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our name. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. Thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have not done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and us, that we may be like in your will and walk in your way. Amen. 
Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. point our service, we make our offering to God uh, and recognize all those gifts to God through our church, uh, given this week through online means. Praise God. again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you always.